Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the New England Aquarium and the Simons Theater. It's really an honor and a privilege to see so many people here in person. Also, um, hearty welcome to those that are tuning in via the live stream, for which there are many of you near and far. Uh, thank you for joining us virtually. Tonight, um, for our New England Aquarium lecture series, we'll be presenting Exploring Massachusetts and Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary with acclaimed underwater photographer, my friend and colleague, Keith Ellenbogen. <laughs> Couple of housekeeping items. If everybody can just remember to silence your phones, that would be fantastic, those that are here live. Also, if anybody needs to use the restrooms, they are the rear of the auditorium. Just go up either side on the staircase and through the main exit door in the back and you will find them. Uh, so it's an honor, uh, again, and a privilege to be here. My name is John Mandelman. I am the vice president and chief scientist of the New England Aquarium's Anderson Cabot Center for Ocean Life, which is our ocean research policy and ocean advising institute right within the walls of the aquarium. Um, real honor and privilege to be here. And as part of that work, leading that group, we have done over the years a lot of uh, conservation research in and around Stellwagen Bank. Um, and so being part of tonight's uh, celebration and um, honoring of, of incredible work by our friend Keith Ellenbogen is, is especially uh, indicative or, or connected to what we do here with our mission. Tonight's event um, is made possible with generous support from the Lowell Institute, uh, which allows the aquarium to offer our lecture series free to the public without charge. We have additional sponsors for tonight's event, and I'd love to acknowledge them and the exhibition as well, in addition to the, the lecture. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary, and we have several members of that sanctuary office here, friends and colleagues of ours. The National Marine Sanctuary Foundation, you'll hear more from President and CEO Chris Sari momentarily. And MIT Sea Grant Program at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. We're delighted to be marking the 30th anniversary of Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary. <laughs> Stellwagen is one of 15 federally protected underwater parks in the US. It lies just 25 miles off the coast of Boston and is a robust and thriving ecosystem that we're all very, very proud of. The aquarium, as I noted, has uh, a special connection to Stellwagen. Um, it's also, as, in addition to being uh, a site for our research activities and species that we care about in the ocean, it's the feature destination for the aquarium's whale watches, which are operated in partnership with Boston Harbor Cruises. All summer long, our whale watch trips introduce scores of individuals to the incredible wildlife in Stellwagen and to the importance of protected areas in our ocean. It's now my privilege to introduce Chris Sari. Chris is the president and CEO of the National Marine Sanctuary Foundation. The foundation is a leading voice for United States protected waters, working with communities to conserve and expand those special places for healthy oceans, coasts, and the Great Lakes. Without further ado, Chris. Good evening, everyone. I want to thank everybody who's joining us here and online. Uh, as John mentioned, my name is Chris Seri, and I'm the CEO of the National Marine Sanctuary Foundation. Um, it is my privilege and honor to, to actually lead this nonprofit organization. Our role is to work with the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration, specifically the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries, to really help conserve these very special places. As John mentioned, Stellwagen is celebrating its 30th anniversary. The National Marine Sanctuary uh, System is celebrating its 50th. And we came up with a really kind of simple slogan. It is called, we want to save spectacular. And it's an invitation to everyone to work with us um, broadly to help protect these really spectacular places in our ocean. Now I'm actually the warm up act for Keith here tonight. So I'm gonna actually do a little bit of a warm up. So everybody who's here, and if you're online virtually, raise your hand or stand up if you've been to Stellwagen Bank. Hey, we have, this is great. We're about like 50% of the audience or stand up. <laughs> now, no, keep your hands raised. How many people have actually been in Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary, so don't amass or just jumped off of one of those whale watching boats and in. All right, for folks 
folks, for folks that are online, we went from about 50% of the room to probably about 1% of the room. <laughs> um, and that's one of the challenges that we face. We protect these amazing places that are underwater national parks, right? They have, are home to these incredible species that you will see tonight. They protect these miraculous seascapes and they preserve our maritime history. And all of that is in Stellwagen Bank. But often you can't actually see it. And so what's really special about this partnership that's taking place tonight, and we were really excited that we were able to provide some seed funding for Keith, is Keith is bringing Stellwagen Bank to life. For us and by bringing it to life and I have to tell you a little story I, I got in early from DC this morning and I was walking along looking at the exhibit for the first time and a few different families came by and their children were just so enthusiastic and I was saying they were running up and they were petting the pictures they were interacting they were like the mola mola oh my god and so they'd run up and they'd look at it and then of course who can resist a, a, a shark and so it was this incredible interaction and it just shows you the power of photography and the work that Keith is doing and then I can't thank the National I'm sorry, the New England Aquarium enough for bringing it to life on the on the walls of these buildings and being able to share it with the millions of visitors that are going to actually be able to walk through and start understanding and seeing the beauty of the of the um, Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary. And then finally, I really want to um, commend John Armour, Ben Haskell um, with the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries. They are in such an important role. They are our trustees of these very significant places for our current and future generations. So our kids are going to be able to enjoy these oceans because we have the National Marine Sanctuary System. So it's a tremendous partnership that's bringing all of this around. And so I'm going to stop now and introduce Ben because really what you want to see is Keith's really beautiful photography. Um, I hope you really enjoy this evening and thank you very much all for coming. Thanks very much, Chris. Um, once again, my name is Ben Haskell. I'm the Deputy Superintendent of Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary. Uh, thank you for coming out tonight to help us kick off this 30th anniversary year for Stellwagen Bank, um, as well as the 50th anniversary year uh, for the National Marine Sanctuary System. The director of the system, John Armour, is with us tonight. Um, so John, if you could wave to the audience and the online crowd, there he is over here. Um, not only did John and his staff in the National Marine Sanctuary System help make this exhibit uh, possible, but I also want to thank Chris and the Foundation for their support. We owe uh, a huge debt of gratitude to the New England Aquarium and the amazing team of Vice Presidents Rick Musel, Suzanne Mattis, along with Assistant Vice President James um, Sutherland, and Facilities Director Chris Fernald. They bravely agreed to allow us to drill holes into their building <laughs> um, in order to host this exhibit. Um, and I want to thank MIT Sea Grant for hosting Keith as a visiting artist these past several years and providing him a base of operations. I wanted to give you um, some context for how this exhibit came to be and for the significance of the sanctuary's 30th anniversary and then I'll turn it over to Keith very soon. I've been with the sanctuary for 22 of its 30 years and for the majority of those years I was frustrated that we'd never had a professional underwater photographer to help bring the majesty and mystery of the sanctuary to you, the people, who are ultimately the stewards of this special place. But it's hard to steward and protect a special place if you don't understand it and come to love it. So several years ago, I started trying to figure out how to get um, a photographer hooked on documenting the wildlife of the sanctuary. Given the difficulties of photographing undersea life in New England, this was a rather tall task and would require just the right person. Well, as it turns out, Keith uh, had a similar vision, and our visions converged in 2017 when our friend uh, Allison Nolan um, 
introduced us. We began scheming on how to raise funds for this endeavor, which is when we uh, learned about the National Marine Sanctuary Foundation's uh, grant program for raising awareness of National Marine Sanctuaries. So in 2018, Keith received a three-year grant to start photographing sanctuary wildlife. At the same time, he received a NOAA um, permit to photograph marine mammals underwater, which normally is against the law. Keith had a huge learning curve to overcome given the challenges of photographing constantly moving animals in murky waters. He was just getting the hang of it when along came COVID-19, which slowed him down but didn't stop Keith from finding ways to get out into the sanctuary in the summer of 2020. One thing I've come to appreciate about Keith is that he's a go-getter and boy is he persistent and he comes with a good dose of fortitude. He would spend hours in his wetsuit swimming with his bulky camera valiantly trying to get that elusive shot of the humpback whale or a basking shark underwater. On one particularly more memorable day, when I was out there with him, he slipped into the water off of our inflatable boat in pursuit of what he thought was a basking shark. But it turned out to be the 17 foot long, 3,000 pound great white shark. So we are lucky, and Keith is lucky, to be here today to tell you about this encounter. Before I turn it over to Keith, I want to convey what we hope to achieve through this exhibit. We hope that you become intimately familiar with some of the critters of the sanctuary and how they interact with each other and with their environment. And through that appreciation, you come away with a sense of awe for this spectacular and mysterious watery world. Ultimately, we hope that sense of awe motivates you to do whatever you can to protect this special place we call Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary. It is, after all, your sanctuary. I love the idea of using art to make science more accessible and relatable, but it takes a special artist to make that connection. It takes an artist with a keen eye and a good sense of timing but more importantly, it takes both of those attributes in combination with a passionate soul. Keith has all of these things, and I have developed a deep respect for his artistry. Stellwagen Bank Sanctuary is better off because of his passionate work. So with that, I'm honored to introduce you to acclaimed photographer, Keith Ellen Bogan. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for those really wonderful comments. Um, it's so nice to see everyone here today. And so let's begin our journey into Stellwagen Bank. I'd just like to say again, thank you, everyone here. When I tell people that I'm working on a project in Massachusetts, they are often surprised and commonly ask, is there anything living there? Or what can you see? In contrast, when I let people know I'm traveling on expeditions photographing sperm whales in the Azores, sharks and biodiversity in the Galapagos, coral reefs in the Pacific Ocean, or kelp forests in Monterey, these quote unquote match their, their, their mental image of where life is. But truly, the most remarkable and incredible place I've ever been is right here off the coast of Massachusetts. Within the United States, there are 15 national marine sanctuaries that have been designated by the U.S. government as special places for extraordinary habitat and wildlife. Today, we are here to celebrate the 30th anniversary of Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary and the marine wildlife it supports. Stellwagen is named after Henry Stellwagen, who in the 1850s was commissioned by the U.S. Navy to create a detailed map to identify fishing grounds, and safe passage for navigation routes to Boston Harbor. He mapped the depth of the seafloor by dropping a lead weight over the side of the boat that was attached to a rope. 
the weight had a sticky substance to it so that when it hit the bottom, it would pick up a little bit of the substrate, whether it was rocky, sandy, or muddy. Over the course of a year, he created a detailed map using celestial positioning. His measurements were so accurate that they are only slightly modified with modern day technology. Here is a view of Stellwagen Bank at an altitude of about 1,000 feet while I was flying on a small Cessna plane heading east. Rockport is to the north, Cape Cod is to the south, and Boston, where we are today, is due west. The first thing we realize is it's a big ocean out there. And from this vantage point, it's really hard to visualize a dynamic marine ecosystem. How do you know what is living just below the surface? And why do some marine animals prefer some areas over others? For the non-nautical crowd, a bank refers to a plateau on the seafloor. The sides of Stellwagen Bank are deep, about 600 feet. The top of the plateau is relatively shallow at about 100 to 150 feet. You can imagine it shaped like a box. With the current, when the current hits the side, it upwells and bringing all the nutrient-rich waters to the surface making this a highly productive area. And it turns out that this area is where the whales congregate. But again, why? Well, it turns out that Stellwagen Bank has a nice sandy sea floor, and sand is the perfect habitat for sandlands. As the name implies, these small schooling fish dart in and out of the sand to hide from predators. But they also need to swim up the water column to feed on plankton within our nutrient-rich waters. It's hard to imagine, but they are extremely numerous and incredibly important species that support a dynamic food web, which includes marine mammals, seabirds, and fish. In fact, many marine animals migrate into our waters to feed on them. But given their abundance, from a photographer's perspective, they are elusive, hard to find, and even harder to photograph, almost always staying just beyond the reach of my lens. Within the deep ocean waters, life gets a little bit more exciting. A giant bait ball of sandlands is pushed to the surface by a pod of dolphins underneath. From above, a shearwater seabird dives in to feed on the sandlands. You can see here the sandlands are being pushed over to the edge. The fish are aware and react quickly, but the predators are fast, even faster. This picture was taken while I was free diving at a depth of about 30 feet. Can you imagine, just for a moment, the ability of a seabird? They are able to descend underwater. Now, their feathers trap air so they don't get wet. They adjust their vision from air to sea. They move fast enough to catch a fish with their mouth. They hold their breath. They return to the surface, and they can fly away. In contrast, I need a wetsuit, weights, a mask, snorkel, and as athletic as I think I am, I cannot come close to catching a single fish. <laughs> Scientists at NOAA Stellwagen Bank Sanctuary are applying satellite tags to understand the migration movements of shearwater seabirds as a way of possibly understanding the distribution of sandlands and humpback whales. If you look closely in the center of the image at the Great Shearwater, you can see a satellite tag that was just applied. It's now being released back Humpback whales also travel to Massachusetts and to Stellwagen Bank to feed on the abundance of sandlands and other prey fish. From the air, this is a view of humpback whales feeding using a technique called bubble net. As the name implies, the whales release air underwater and create a net that traps the sandlands. Then the whales accelerate through the net upward, taking a big gulp of thousands of fish. At the surface, you can see humpback whales working together and seabirds feeding as the gorge themselves, as all the sandlands are near the surface. <laughs> Have you ever looked close at a humpback whale with its mouth wide open? You can see the baleen, the water dripping. All right, so this is one of my favorite pictures of a whale descending underwater. You may notice something doesn't look right. You can't see the body of the whale. This is due to the nutrient-rich waters, the abundance of plankton. As a result of that abundance, it makes it difficult for marine photography. 
Within our local waters, typically we only have about zero sometimes to 25 feet of visibility. For this photo, I'm only about 20 feet away from the whale using a wide angle lens. This is one of the photographic challenges. Another is finding the animals. I just want to highlight what Ben was saying and let everyone know that I have a NOAA Marine Mammal Photography Permit, which really allows me the unique access and permission to photograph these marine animals underwater. Otherwise, this is uh, strictly prohibited. All right, this is my first photograph of a humpback whale underwater. And as you can see, I'm not gonna win any awards for this photograph. <laughs> but it does give you a sense of the local conditions and the size. And just to give you a sense of this, this screen is 85 feet long. The whale is about 50 feet. That's virtually a real life scale picture of a whale. When it extends its flipper forward, that's about 20 feet, just at the edge of my visibility. But I can only see 25 feet. Here and there lies the challenge of my underwater photography. But there really are magical moments underwater where animal behavior, light, and composition all come together. And I'd like to introduce you to a juvenile whale that I've affectionately named Junior Mint. I was on the water with the Stellwagen Bank team where we encountered a mother and a calf. When I entered the water with a mask, snorkel, fins, and my camera, something amazing happened. The juvenile whale approached me out of curiosity. We spent a little bit of time pausing and just gazing into one another's eyes. I was able to capture a few pictures that really are some of the most remarkable moments I've ever had underwater. A whale or a fish's perspective of a seagull flying just above the surface. I've always wondered, what does a whale or a fish think of air? In the open ocean, you never know what to expect. Sometimes I encounter beautiful blue sharks that can reach burst speeds of 30 miles an hour. They are big. This one is about eight feet long. And under certain circumstances, these sharks are curious and swim close. For me, the iridescent blue coloration and its puppy dog brown eyes or black eyes are just absolutely mesmerizing. Mola Mola or ocean sunfish, they are the world's largest bony fish and are often seen just beneath the surface, sunning themselves. It's remarkable to me. People travel all over the world and get excited to see a Mola Mola and they are just here off the coast of Massachusetts. Another important species is within Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary are schooling mackerel. Their sparkling greens and blues really illuminate the ocean. But this is only a surface level perspective. To see what mackerel really look like, you have to dive into the water to photograph them. This may seem like an easy task, just jump in and get my shot. But life isn't that simple. The primary challenge is that these animals have learned to keep a distance beyond the potential predator and the reach of my strobe and lens. However, on this particular day, and of all the times I've been underwater, this is the only day they have done this. For one reason or another, this school of mackerel surrounded me, and I was able to capture this image. The patterns of the fish, the foreground-background relationship, the speed at which they move, are all incredibly difficult to photograph, but seem so relatively easy when you show it as a picture. It was very hard to get this focus and get them all in focus, to be perfectly honest. And I imagine this is also true and confusing for predators, which makes their schooling and their color and their pattern all so, so interesting. Within the open ocean, other unusual creatures we see are lion's mane jelly, a stinging jelly. And in this very center here, you can see a juvenile haddock. This seeks shelter within its tentacles. Haddock are an important commercial fish within our local waters. Other jellies are the Portuguese man of war. If you can avoid it, don't get stung by this one. But for me, this is an artistic quality to nature. For a moment, let's just appreciate the various hues of the tentacles. From an artistic point of view, it seems easiest to just make all the tentacles one solid color, but then life would be boring and it would lack creativity and imagination. Gray seals are curious. I'm not sure why this one approached me in the open ocean, but it did. And for this photograph, I had to quickly change the settings from underwater to above and below the water. Over time, my reflexes to react and change aperture, shutter, reposition strobes have all become second nature. No one really believes me, but I practice all the time. 
Atlantic white-sided dolphin. You know, part of white, uh, wildlife photography is putting myself in an environment to have an opportunity to capture these portraits of these marine animals. The ocean is a big place, and most of the time, dolphins don't just swim up and approach. But with lots of persistence and opportunities, opportunities do occur. As a photographer, I often position myself with the light and so I can get the picture I want. But with dolphins, they're a little smarter than the average animal, and they try to position me so that they get the better view vantage point, which makes photography all the more difficult. And I've learned that it's a, a poetic little dance that is very fun between subject and photographer. From the open ocean to the near shore waters, this is a bushy back nudibranch. These are tiny, maybe just a couple of inches in length. There are lots of nudibranchs worldwide. All of them are extremely colorful with vibrant patterns. People travel all over the world looking for these cute little nudibranchs, and they are right here off of our coast in New England. Flowering eelgrass. Now, eelgrass and seagrass beds are nurseries for small fish and sequester carbon as a buffer for climate change. But did you know seagrasses are the only flowering plants underwater? Now, what's amazing is that pollination occurs without bees or butterflies. I mean, how does the pollen travel from one plant to the other? At the simplest level, it must just drift in the ocean. But what are the odds that pollen reached the flower? A process that people are still trying to understand in great detail. To me, it's miraculous that they pollinate. Along the sea floor, at a depth of about 110 feet within Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary, is a torpedo ray that lays motionless. These rays have an amazing ability to emit electricity and can stun or kill its prey. If you look closely at other ambush predators that use the art of camouflage, you can see a goosefish here. It's two eyes and large mouth. Winter flounder, one of the most important commercial fishers in this region. But I just love this photo and portrait of it. It really has an engaging, expressive expre uh, a composition and expression. It seems so curious to me. We have puffer fish. And then one night, I was also free diving, looking for giant balls of, uh, bait balls of, uh, of squid. I was diving in what's called black water, a term used for diving at night. And then uh, on this particular night, I spent uh, many hours in the water looking for these animals, or as far as my light could travel. For most of the night, I couldn't see anything. I didn't find anything to photograph. And then at about 11 p.m., I was with Captain Dave Slocum, who is here today, said, it's time to quit. And for those of you that know me, I'll really basically never quit unless someone pushes me to leave. <laughs> and just at that moment when he said that, when I thought all hope was lost, I said, hey, I see a school of squid right under there. Dave didn't believe me, but he pointed the light and saw it. And I began free diving a little bit longer and was able to capture just a few frames of a ball of squid underwater. Over the past four years, I've been looking to photograph squid eggs. And just last year, for the very first time, I was able to find them. Uh, you can see them here, just sort of drifting in the current. But you ever wonder what one of these egg sacs look like? And so under the microscope, this is an image of developing squid within an egg case. You can see their little bodies developing. Then, late night, while I was doing this, around 2.30 in the morning, all of a sudden they started to hatch. I couldn't believe it. I captured a couple of images and just want everyone to know that I released the rest of them back into the ocean, past the waves at night. These are also eggs of the American lobster. You can almost tell from the beautiful colors, the yellow and orange hues. By the way, the dark patches are their eyes that are developing. Within the plankton phase of the, of the larval lobster, this is a stage four, my favorite, it's Superman phase. It's referred to this because it swims with its arm out, it's fast, and it's colorful. The symbol of uh, an adult one of these, the symbol of New England, our American lobster, and with my very best Boston accent, lobster. <laughs> For most of us, uh, the perception of lobster is really dinner at a restaurant. But they are also have an incredible life story. New England lobsters have two claws. Its right claw is used for cutting things like dead fish. Its big meaty left claw is used to crush shells. And to find their prey, they use an antenna to pick up the scent of dead animals. 
But for me, one of the most rewarding parts of this project is engaging also with students at MIT Sea Grant in all aspects of this project. We are bringing students into the field to deepen their understanding about the visual complexities of the marine environment. Pictured above is an undergraduate research student who is learning for the first time, for a short period of time, how to drive a boat. Our nutrient-rich waters are what makes New England so special. But to view these alien-like creatures, we have to explore the microscopic scale. To do this, we conduct a plankton tow by placing a net in the water and towing it for a duration of time. The result is a nice concentrated sample. I bring that back to the lab at MIT Sea Grant, and here you can see how dense it appears. This is part of what makes my photography so difficult. Again, you can't see the plankton, it's too small, but you can't see through the other side of the bowl. Using compound and light microscopes, I apply my skills as an underwater photographer, but just now at the microscopic scale. Each slide is a journey of exploration. While some plankton are more prevalent than others, just like you never know what you're going to see when scuba diving, the same principle holds true under a single slide. And here are a few examples that I think you guys might like. This is a larval crab at its megalops stage. Now just note for a second its beautiful compound eyes and its tiny little claws. Soon this creature will drop to the seafloor bottom and turn into a tiny but a fully formed crab. A single-celled plankton called radiolarian. As the name applies, its spines are radiating outward and its beautiful pink-tinted body. This is a good example of the artistry of making micro photographs. I use dark field illumination, photo stacking, and a number of other techniques to get the image just the way I'm looking to photograph it. This is a centric marine diatom at a, hundred, at a scale of about 100 micrometers. Now, while it may seem like I just place the animal on a slide under a cover slip and take a picture, but that's not what happens. These are living creatures swimming, moving, and if you can believe it, a drop of water is like being in an ocean filled with movement of them being able to go up, down, left, right, along the side of the, within the slide. One of the most important species in our local waters is a calanoid uh, copepod. This one is uh, food for right whales, basking sharks, and a whole slew of other fish and animals that are important in this area. My personal favorite are zooplankton, the avadni. This one is pregnant, and you can see within the center of it the, a number of them uh, that are pregnant with it. Uh, you can see them developing there. Um, and like many creatures, they're able to reproduce very quickly. But this picture also shows the depth of field and the depth at which a single drop of water is placed. That be below the other one are stacking, I can see one, two, three, four, five of them that look like they're in the deep ocean. An image of three dinoflagellates. These are single-celled algae and an important component to phytoplankton. Now, phytoplankton perform a function similar to land plants, producing much of the oxygen we, we breathe. I particularly like this composition that creates a sense of motion, movement, and to me symbolizes a healthy ocean. It's amazing for me to think about that the smallest creatures in our ocean can make the largest living impression, so large that they are captured from space or orbiting satellites over 500 miles away. Our technique is to use a Landsat 8, NASA Landsat 8 raw satellite data and to turn that into visualizations that showcase the abundance of phytoplankton. Over the last four years, I've been working with a team of undergraduate students at MIT Sea Grant at the intersection of art, science, and technology to visualize phytoplankton in our ocean. This is what's called an enhanced visualization, meaning that we are creating visualizations that show the abundance of phytoplankton in the ocean. If you were to just look at the ocean, it would appear green or blue, much as you see it with your own eyes. But through this image and image processing, we can tease out the phytoplankton and show what it looks like drifting in the ocean. The important part here is that we are trying to show the gravitas of the littlest creatures that have on the impact of our planet. Our process is to utilize the raw data from NASA Landsat 8 satellites. Now this raw data captures light that is reflected to Earth in different wavelengths called spectral bands. We then use some specialized software, process the raw data, and capture it into an image format. Over time, it's developed, uh, we've developed some scripts to be able to clean up the striping, and you can see some striping and imperfections on the left-hand side of the image. Um, 
And the students then go through and clean up any other imperfections and turn it into what I consider both a work of art and something that's scientifically significant. It's an incredible detailed process that requires both technical and artistic ability. And each series of images for each date that they process takes about 10 hours to create. We've created six different variations, excuse me. We've created six different variations to showcase the impact of our nutrient rich waters. This is the enhanced visualization and you'll notice some cloud coverage which is always present every time the satellite orbits over this area. A second view is a chlorophyll A version of something and you immediately notice the higher concentration in estuaries and along the coast, mostly because of the higher concentrations of nitrogen. And then we've created these visualizations into a number of different subcategories. These are dinoflagellates, the large diverse group of single-celled algae that are of immense importance to the marine ecosystems worldwide, forming the base of the food chain for which much of the aquatic life depends. They're also a producer of oxygen. We have green algaes that are a diverse and phytoplankton group. These contain both chlorophyll A, chlorophyll B pigments, and give them their distinct green color. Diatoms, one of the most abundant and diverse groups of phytoplankton, and hapatites, which are the greatest numbers in the open ocean rather than in our near shores. These play a central role in the carbon cycle and of absorbing carbon through photosynthesis and the calcification of their shells. And for this project, what we've done is created visualizations in where art meets science. Sort of view this as Andy Warhol-esque color palette meets RGB colors that are defined on the left that correspond to the percentage of chlorophyll uh, in the ocean. These colors are named, we've sort of named them as hapatite blues, green algae greens, dinoflagellate yellows, and di uh, diatom purples to give us our own, our unique palette. On exhibit, when we go over there in a little bit, we processed over five years of satellite data to show movements of plankton over time. And we still have many more years to go. I would just like to acknowledge for one second uh, one of the MIT students, Emma Rutherford, who is here. But really, there are many students who have participated who are all extraordinary. But she particularly helped to design the exhibition that you will see of the satellite images uh, when we go for a walk. So I just want to thank her for that. Emma. I should say that Chloe and Alice are also here, and Dries, who are wonderful students who uh, have immensely contributed to this project, so thank you. I really hope that these colorful satellite images reveal a connection to the plankton, which in turn bring the charismatic animals to our local New England wildlife, or New England waters. So from the satellites to a seaplane, that's me in the passenger seat as we begin looking for marine life. From the air, here is uh, uh, fin whales, the second largest species of whales lunge feeding on small fish and plankton. These animals are so large that the only way to really fully appreciate them is from the air or a bird's eye perspective. At an altitude of 1,500 feet using a telephoto lens, right whales are feeding on copepods. The North Atlantic right whale are one of the most endangered species with the population estimated at 350. They are susceptible to ship strike, entanglement, climate change. But organizations like the New England Aquarium is a leader in researching the North Atlantic right whale and along with many other organizations are working hard to help save this uh, wonderful species. This is a close up portrait of a right whale with its mouth open feeding on the copepods that we just saw images of. It was really an extraordinary moment to watch them move side to side, so slowly swimming, feeding. And they are here right off the coast of Massachusetts. From the North Atlantic right whale to other iconic species that plankton support are uh, a basking shark. This is the world's second largest shark. Now, typically their mouths are wide open feeding. I think I'm the only person here who's photographed one with its, uh, I have yet to see its mouth open, is what I'm trying to say. So something I'm still trying to get a photograph of. In conclusion, I'd like to end with one of the most remarkable underwater moments I've ever experienced. In my quest to photograph basking sharks, one day, as Ben was saying, the sea was absolutely flat calm. It's not really always like this, but on these really wonderful days, uh, sometimes life can be very special. On board the Noah uh, Auk and then on this small skiff pictured here, 
We saw a fin at the surface. It was moving slowly. I just want to highlight that the fin we thought we saw was a basking shark. Now that fin is on one of the windows in the back facing, uh, the, um, uh, facing the ocean. So when you walk around to see the exhibition, please be sure to check out the, the basking shark fin. So what happened was on this day, we identified it as a basking shark. We stayed far away so that I could photograph it. I slipped in the water with a uh, mass, snorkel, fins, uh, just free diving, and a multi-camera system to be able to shoot 360 degrees virtual reality. I started swimming towards, towards the animal. And on this day, you can see the, um, the green water. Again, we only have 20 to 25 feet of visibility. So I start swimming towards it. My eyes go from the surface to underwater, the surface to underwater. And what I see are pillars of light just descending, dancing. I'm prepared to see a basking shark. My breathing has changed. My rhythm is moving. I'm sort of getting myself ready to descend underwater. When all of a sudden, instead of encountering this beautiful basking shark, I saw a pointy snout, a white underbelly. And at the time I noticed it, when I was 25 feet away, I realized at that very moment, I was no longer encountering a basking shark, but rather an enormous great white shark. To give you a sense of it, here is 11 seconds of a shark swimming slowly, of which we passed each other. At the very moment, you'll see it's with a wide angle lens, it's meant to be viewed in virtual reality. And here is what it looked like when you start to approach based on the uh, thing. I was so close to this shark, I could have touched it. In fact, I thought I was going to touch it. I had to move my fins, put on the brakes, and hope that I uh, didn't. But I did during that time is the only thing I've really ever known what to do, which is slow my heartbeat down, keep the camera steady, and get the shot. It was really a, an amazing moment. And what it shows me is that these sharks are apex predators. I certainly would never do this again. <laughs> but they are not mindless killers just hunting everything, but rather just the, the top of the food chain that shows a healthy ocean ecosystem and really why this is one of the wildest and most extraordinary places, uh, I think, of anywhere I've been. This is an example of the image that would be laid flat if the Earth, if you opened up three cameras, you can see me uh, in the picture, um, and then the shark coming forward. In conclusion, I just want to say that I think photography has the power to change our understanding of the world around us. And it really is my goal to use the artistry of underwater photography to transform public perception that sparks our imagination, inspires conservation, and builds local stewardship about the extraordinary underwater wildlife within Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary and New England. Thank you very much. But, thank you. But, but before we conclude, thank you. Before we conclude, before we conclude, I just want to say a few words that um, I just want to say a special thanks, and everyone has said this, so I'll just keep it brief, to all our partners. And I want to really uh, say that there are many individuals who helped make this possible. It could have not been done without all of their support, and I'm internally grateful for everyone who has contributed. I want to lastly just give one last round of hand uh, applause to Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary for its 30th anniversary. I want to provide a little bit of shameless self-promotion. <laughs> Along the exhibit, we're trying to boost uh, a social media and Instagram, so please join in on all of us as we're doing all of this. I just want to highlight that if anyone has any questions or comments, feel free to reach out to me. I'm happy to take any questions that you might have. And after a few questions with uh, John and a QA, I want to invite everyone to walk along the north and south side of the New England Aquarium for an exhibition that will show these, some of these really spectacular animals that I think most people don't get to see often either when diving or free diving or enjoying our local waters. And I hope it does build an appreciation that just off our coast, all of these animals live and they are here, they are part of New England, they are part of our story, and it's really the most remarkable place I've been, and I hope we change our view that if all the places to go, the best place is right here at home. Thank you very much.
Thanks. Really, thank you all so much. That's so kind. Yeah. Uh, well. Thank you again, really. Thank you. What do you want? This one? Yeah. Yeah. What's that? That was simply, this is live, that was simply incredible. Uh, your narrative, uh, taking us on that journey with you, uh, not to mention your awe-inspiring art and work, um, just incredible. Congratulations. Thanks, John, so much. So now we are going to take some questions from the audience. I'm also going to sprinkle in some questions from our online uh, viewers. And just a reminder to all those folks uh, joining us virtually to drop your questions in the chat. I have this amazing technological advantage of having Suzanne send me these questions via text. I'm not <laughs> sc scrolling while I'm sitting up here with you, Keith. Uh, but we're going to um, start out. So let's take a question from the audience to start. And I'm going to repeat those questions just for the benefit of those tuning in remotely. Right there in my chart. Uh, you mentioned using photo layering in your microscopic data. Yeah, sure. So, uh, let me just repeat that. Yeah, sorry for the online audience. So photo layering. Um, the question is about photo layering and how Keith works that into his, his art. Yeah. So um, when you photograph using a microscope, the is there When you photograph using a, a microscope, the depth of field is very shallow, so what is in focus is what you focus on. So the technique is to focus at multiple planes, shot, focus, 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 and then you composite that together into a single image that shows a, uh, the total focal plane of the animal. The trick is, and the complicating part, is these animals are living and they're moving, and if they move, then you can't stack it. And so you have to get the right combination of an animal that sits still short enough while you stack quick enough <laughs> and capture those kind of images to, to get them. Um, but the process is, is, is basically that. Yep. Quick follow-up question. Uh, how many photos do you usually layer on top of the question is how many photos does Keith usually photo layer? Yeah. There's not like a, a single recipe for it. It really depends on the size of the image or its orientation. Um, it can be anything from five or to 20 or 30 or something like that. It really depends. Yeah. We're going to do an online question now. Um, the first one is from Abigail. How has climate change affected Stellwagen from your perspective? Yeah. Well, first of all, I'm a photographer and I feel fortunate to work with scientists who are, are studying these and, and working with animals. The things that I've noticed anyway is that the patterns, the moving, the time of year that animals are here or where their predictable locations have been changing over time and makes it all the more difficult. So when I work with scientists who say like, hey, typically the animals are here at this time to go photograph them, it varies a little bit here and there. And that has been a, a, a thing that has been very difficult. Um, I think the migration timing of animals is off, I've noticed a little bit. And I think a good example of that, and John, you can uh, talk about like cold stunned sea turtles stay around a little bit longer. And then all of a sudden the temperature, so Kemp's Ridley sea turtles that are in our local waters sort of may stay here a little bit longer because the water stays warmer for a duration. And then all of a sudden in the later part of the winter, early winter, when they start to go, it gets cold too quick for them a little bit. Um, and so um, those are some of the things. And I think, um, also, there's a lot of concern of the plankton, really, to be perfectly honest, that those are changing. And climate change on their small scale size um, is, has a great impact on a little animal, much more than a big animal. And one of the things that I wanted to really highlight, and I hope the connection comes, is the right whales are dependent on these little creatures. And so if those things change, so do the right whales. So do the basking sharks. So do the small sand lands that the whales depend on. And so some of those things that are predictable that could change, that are small, that maybe we don't anticipate, are changing. Um, but I would really defer to someone like John on climate change questions to help uh, with that. 
for another day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We'll stick to you today. Yeah, thanks. Another question from the audience. question is, how does Keith deal with lighting, um, given all the variables that he has to encounter in the, in the open water? Yeah, that, that's a great question. I mean, basically, my whole life is spent around chasing light. And I think the, the challenge here is that um, you basically, the, I mean, I use two strobes that are fairly powerful. And you want to create an arc of light that illuminates the subject, but not too much or too little. And so I spend all day really working on not only where the light is coming from above, so I'm very aware of where that is, as well as how to position these strobes. There's no really easy answer to just say this is how you do it. Um, but I will say that um, it is important to put light on the subject so that you bring out these colors uh, that are all real colors of, of how these animals are doing it. And I should really highlight one thing. Um, I don't do uh, hardly any photo editing to these pictures. Uh, I believe very much in the art of taking the picture for how I actually spent time photographing it. Um, and so the light and the colors are as they are illuminated underwater with the strobes um, that I use. Um, and so the key is to find, in many instances, I think uh, a project like this, what's so difficult are the conditions are so hard. So you're seeing the best of the pictures over a four year period. But I may have encounters in which the visibility isn't right. And no matter what you do, you can't shoot through those things. And so it's been really uh, uh, a matter of time underwater to be able to photograph them and to have the conditions aligned so that the lights, the strobes, and their animal position can be in a, in a way to, to capture an image that I, that I at least feel is compelling. You're telling me these weren't the only shots you took? Surprisingly, uh, no. Just <laughs> the whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. disappointed in you. Yeah, yeah it's a lot of times in the uh, New England waters, they're very murky. And uh, so I was really impressed by the shot here. The comments were about the visibility and, and just the being impressed with Keith's work and under those conditions. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. A couple questions online. So you mentioned four years, and Chris and Ben were both mentioning that in their opening comments. and. Great question online from Kristen um, Eigenman, who asks, how many hours did you spend under wa underwater to get all these great picks collectively? Yeah, um, I would say thousands of hours underwater. Um, I mean, I go out as much as I can. The, the days start for a photographer, me. I mean, animals wake up early in the morning. The boats leave. Captain stands here. They leave at 5 in the morning. You got to get to the place, or you're up at 4 in the morning to get there. The boat goes out. I spend the day in the wetsuit, in and out of the water. Um, and then by the time you're back, it's, you know, five o'clock in the afternoon and sometimes I'm doing my microscopy work until two in the morning or so. So the days are long and I'm in and out of the water all the time. Um, sometimes it's diving and when you're scuba diving, you have as much time as you can stay with the tanks and the depth that you're at. But when free diving, I'm bound by only the amount of time that the conditions allow me to be in the water or that the captain will stay out there with me really. <laughs> Let me, let me tag onto that because that's, that connects to a question we got um, online from, um, let's see here, Amelia Callagher. Um, she asked, why did you choose free diving over scuba during your photography sessions? And I'll just maybe extend that question to also ask like, how much is stealth important and did that come into play here in terms of not spooking some of these critters? Yeah. Um, well, I, I do both, and it really depends which animal I'm after. Um, if it's shallow enough that I can free dive and stay with it, then that's an easier method for me to get in and out of the water uh, more frequently. Um, so I like that technique. If I'm going to stay underwater for a duration of time, then scuba diving is easier. But scuba diving creates bubbles. The animals react. 
the visibility isn't that great under there. So the more I can stay stealth and just free dive down and sort of wait on the bottom for as long as I can hold my breath, then um, that tends to be a good, a good technique that, or, or technique that has worked successfully for me. Um, and I do train a lot. I keep in good shape. I, I work out as best as I can. My eating habits might not be as, as perfect, but <laughs> uh, and COVID has not been great. But the, the, um, I do uh, work out a lot to be able to do this. And it's not easy. It's a lot of physical work, and it's a lot of equipment. For anyone who's been with me, you know, there are multiple cameras. You got to carry them from the dock to the boat. And uh, so I think that helps in, in a lot of these. But um, one thing I should really note is in the water, you have to change your ability the way you breathe. There's a, you know, with you're with marine mammals, it's so interesting. You learn to be much more conscious of like, what does it feel like to take a deep breath? And like right now we just sit here breathing. But when I'm in the water, I'm very aware of like my own breathing. What is it, what does that breath feel like to go in, to sort of pause? Where are my limitations for where my body feels a little bit uncomfortable? How can I push myself to what extent beyond? And then uh, when I take an, an inhalation and an exhalation. And I think those are just remarkable feelings that I, that I practice a lot. Uh, and work towards my photography as well. Excellent. Another question from the audience. Yes, George. Keith, you mentioned earlier that you started your career here at the New England Aquarium as an intern. I think that's where we first met. How important are those type of programs to young people that are looking to enter the field? Yeah, great question. Uh, great question from George Buckley about how important is it to have programs like the one Keith uh, was involved in here at the New England Aquarium when they're starting out? Yeah. I mean, I would describe it as one of the most important experiences uh, that I could have ever done as, as a young child. And I, I'm eternally grateful that the aquarium offers these opportunities for people to volunteer. I didn't know the path my life was going to go in at that early time. But they're informative programs in which you learn skills that you don't know what you're going to learn at that age. And so I learned to care for the animals. Well, by learning how to care for them and clean them and where they hide, you learn how to look for animals in your photography. And I think it gave a global perspective of, of what it meant to care for an environment, what it meant to take care of it, and also to learn. I mean, I'm an artist and a photographer, and that's my trade. But it also connected me with scientists and an appreciation for what the animals do. And throughout my career, I've been fortunate to be teamed up with people like John, who are world experts in their field, and to learn from them about the animals that I'm trying to photograph. And so when I look back on my career, I, uh, there aren't enough words to express my thanks for the aquarium in those early days for that program. I volunteered for two years when I was in high school. And then when I was in college, I just kept coming back in the summers because I loved it so much and continuing on. And in many ways, I've never left here. Um, I've maintained many ex expeditions with them and continued to work. And so um, I encourage anyone who has kids or, or actually at any point in their life who wants to volunteer, these are great organizations to do that for. Two more questions, one from the audience, one online. I saw you had your hand up. Yeah. question request based on uh, Keith's delivery is to uh, maybe discuss a little bit more about the link between art and science as it pertains to his presentation and work. Yeah. Thanks. You know, I think there's a, a visual language that happens and a photograph can tell a very large and compelling story. And I think I work hard uh, and I'm very curious about oftentimes being paired with scientists who are understanding very complex subjects and then I think to myself, well, how could I visualize that? Or what do I want to see or show? And there's a nice creative synergy that just happens naturally between the two that is really wonderful. And I think that uh, uh, it's forced me to push the boundaries between those two, my own craft of photography. How do I get an image? Someone will say something, well, you need it like this, or a little bit like that, or this focus on this one thing. And it's forced me as a photographer to um, try and communicate that in a way that is interesting. It's also forced me on how do you be innovative? How can you create things in new and exciting ways? What are different technologies? In this case, it's all mostly photographs, but the photographs and the, I think the satellite images are all very unique in their own way. Um, and so it's a wonderful intersection and a space to be in, and uh, I love it. Awesome. Last question. You mentioned earlier uh, in the response to the climate change question around Kemp's Ridley's and cold stunning. Have you seen 
uh, leatherbacks, Kemp's, loggerheads. I know our scientists here would love to know if you saw Kemp's in the wild. We only unfortunately mm. encounter them when they've been cold stunned and stranded and we are rescuing them. But have you seen them in the wild? Have you seen any other sea turtles in your travels out on cell wagon? You know, of all the animals, it's also on my highest of lists. Um, unbelievably, I've not seen uh, a sea turtle from in the water here locally. I've seen them on a boat and I've seen them from the plane, um, but I've not been in the water with the Kemp's Ridley or loggerhead here, so I'm looking for, for them to find. Um, and that's the, really the, the, the challenge of this area in many ways from communicating these, these animals. We all know what a sea turtle is or a sea turtle looks like, but oftentimes our picture of them is from a place far, far away. Uh, not from our local waters, and they're here, and they're here actually, I think, in fairly large numbers. The problem is, is that you don't see them very often. <laughs> um, and so even from the research point of view, um, and so no, I'm really looking to photograph them on the, in the water, in the wild, um, and I too have only seen them as, as cold stunned here. Excellent. Thank you, Keith. And again, I think I speak on behalf of everyone, thanking you for taking us on this incredible journey. It's clear from being your friend and colleague, and now tonight, especially the culmination of this, just seeing how much your heart and soul has been uh, put into this, this work, your art, this exhibition, Stellwagen in general, and honoring this amazing sanctuary in its 30th year, and the sanctuary program in general in its 50th year. Special night, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks, John. Thank you all. Um, thank you. I think while there's a little bit of light, I think our- oh, Yes, yeah, okay. so I'll, I'll just touch on that. Once again, a couple of closing comments. Um, thank you, acknowledging the Lowell Institute for supporting this lecture, as well as the lecture uh, co-sponsors tonight and our partners in this event. If you enjoyed the program and want to support our ocean education, outreach, conservation work, uh, please consider a contribution to the New England Aquarium at neaq.org. Um, one other note, as Keith alluded, uh, so those of us that are here in person, we're going to have a few tours. We're going to split up. I um, mean, we have some, some, some distinguished tour guides tonight that are going to help us out. So Keith is one. Ben is another. Ben who, Haskell, who spoke to you earlier. Ants Mercina, where are you? Way in the back. Um, Anne's going to be guiding one. And then uh, Ashlyn D'Amelia is going to be um, leading another. Where's Ashlyn? Is she here? She might be in the lobby. OK, she might be in the lobby. OK, so we're going to have four distinct groups. Everybody's going to want to crowd around you, Keith. No disrespect to our other distinguished yeah. individuals, but um, thanks again, yeah. and looking forward to seeing the exhibit. Yep. Yeah. Thanks, everyone.